So three o'clock, I think we're up to really get started. We know people will be trickling in. Uh, make sure to grab snacks if you would like. There's pizza left over from the student lunch, so it's like new to learn. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Bruno, who's from the Department of Biology at UNC Chapel Hill. Dr. Bruno has a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Brown University, and he served as a postdoc at Cornell working in disease ecology. He primarily studies marine ecology in the Galapagos and Caribbean, and his seminar title has changed a little bit. So today we'll be hearing about can we enhance the resilience of coral reefs to climate change? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. This is my first post-COVID seminar. And I was last here six years ago, and a couple of days ago I realized I didn't talk about the Galapagos. So I didn't want you to have to hear the same talk twice. So I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing. Hey, Connor. Hey. We've got a macroecology of Caribbean coral reefs to answer the question, can we increase the resilience of reefs um, to climate change related impacts? So historically, Caribbean reefs were dominated by branching corals like the Coropora cervic corners here in the foreground and much longer lived boulder corals um, in the background. So the, the living Coral cover on the sea floor would have been something like 50, 60, 65% um, back in the day. And when I was a kid, I grew up in South Florida. Um, Caribbean, well, reefs of the Florida Keys in, in the shallow waters were dominated by a crop or a palmata, this elkhorn coral here. And you could float over these just endless thickets of palmata. It's golden in color. And it was just like flying and they were just full of fishes because they provide a refuge for fishes down in there. Um, so this would have been like 60, 80% living coral cover on these shallow reefs um, where it was really thriving. And this is just completely gone. So this species is not extinct. There's individual colonies in the middle of Florida, but they're like kilometers apart and they're really small. So, you know, just in the past 40 years, um, we've just seen this drastic, rapid ecological change at a regional scale. And it's primarily due um, to climate change. So this is a, a meta-analysis of coral cover survey data across the whole greater Caribbean and the different subregions are um, color-coded over here. And this is just an average trend line um, going over time. And we don't really have good baseline data for what it looked like back in the day. So we really only started quantitatively surveying reefs in the late 70s, early 80s. So the sample sizes were actually quite small back then. Um, but I've done a lot of work uh, interviewing scientists who have been working on reefs in the 60s and 70s and looking at old photographs. And our sense is that the historical baseline was something like 50 or 60 percent. So it wasn't 100 because there's always been disturbance on reefs. There's always been storms and predator outbreaks, and disease outbreaks, and that kind of thing. Um, so we think the baseline was somewhere up in here. And we've been losing coral cover at about 1 percent per year pretty much my whole like adult lifetime since I graduated high school. Um, and in some regions, it's much worse. So this is Florida here. So Florida, again, back in the day was really gorgeous. Now Florida is about 4% coral cover and it's still declining. And as I said, um, primarily due to ocean warming related to greenhouse gas emissions, obviously. In some locations, there's certainly localized factors, pollution, uh, other forms of like development and disturbance driving that trend. But a lot of it, or a large portion of it in most places, is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So these are climate stripes. Are y'all familiar with climate stripes? So these depict temperature change over time. Obviously, the warmer colors are higher temperature. Um, so these are used a lot just for science communication to the general public to depict trends in temperature. And so obviously, this is cooler back here. And uh, this is climate stripes for Caribbean coral reefs. So it's based on uh, an integrated data set of institute observation and satellite temperature measurements. And so reefs have been warming for a long time. So we we're first able to detect warming on Caribbean reefs uh, in the 1930s. There was a bit of a pause in the late 60s and early 70s uh, when warming essentially paused globally due to aerosol emissions. And then it really took off um, after that. And it's actually accelerating over the last 10 or 15 years. 
And so two of the major disturbances caused by ocean warming are disease outbreaks. And this is yellow band disease, which is pretty tightly linked to uh, temperature. And of course, coral bleaching. So this is mass bleaching uh, in Puerto Rico, where all these very long-lived corals uh, turn white because they've expelled their symbiotic zoonotic belly. In this location, they actually recovered. So it wasn't that warm and it didn't stay warm for very long, but it can be lethal if it's too warm or the, the temperature, uh, temperatures are elevated for too long. So these are the main drivers, um, temperature. And of course it matters to biodiversity because corals are the foundation species of reef ecosystems. So they build that big complex structure. They play the same role that trees build in the forest. Um, the trees play in the forest, mostly just providing refuges from predation. So lots of fishes, uh, myriad invertebrates all use the, the coral skeletons, the living coral skeletons essentially as hiding places from predators. So when you lose the skeletons, um, you lose a lot of the associated species. And of course, humans depend on reefs for all kinds of reasons for uh, tourism incomes for fish, whether it's for food and sustenance or fishes that are sold for jobs. And a really important role of corals as just buffers from waves, and which is becoming a growing problem with increasing storm intensity and sea level rise. So there's a widespread, kind of widely held view in the field that reefs are only sensitive to climate change due to fishing and other local human impacts. Um, so Sylvia Earls have been championing this idea. A lot of kind of the elder spokespersons in the field have been making this argument for really since I was a graduate student. So here's Nancy Naughton. Uh, local protection can make reefs resilient to the impacts of global change. This is Stuart Sandin at Scripps. When ecosystem structure is intact, the corals appear to bounce back better from previous warm water events that have killed the corals. And of course, this type of thinking is, is fairly common, um, at least in the sense that we're all trying to, well, not we're all, but a lot of folks in various aspects of climate change ecology are really focused on increasing resilience. So rather than mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, they're focused on whether it's human systems or natural systems, finding ways to make the system more resilient to you know, various climate change related disturbances. And that's really kind of where this idea stems from. It's also almost goes back to like a Robert May type thinking where more diverse intact systems are just kind of more naturally robust and resilient almost like in an ethereal sense. Um, and this idea now has really been taken up by government agencies, policymakers internationally. So this is NOAA's uh, most recent plan for combating impacts of climate change on reefs in US waters. And the number one strategy is to support a resilience-based management approach to increase resilience to climate change. And then there's other various things, improving fishery sustainability, reducing uh, land-based pollution sources. The Australian government has largely followed the same approach. Rather than mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from coal exports, they're really focused on managed resilience. Um, this is for the state of Hawaii. It's for a couple of years old. So their coral reef management plan, the top actions that they're focusing on is to establish a network of permanent, fully protected MPAs, parks where fishing is either restricted or not allowed. And in theory, other stressors like pollution might be mitigated somewhat uh, to reduce land-based stressors and to effectively manage herbivore populations. So this is really the main focus of these efforts to maintain herbivore populations to make corals resilient to climate change. And it really comes from an almost worship of herbivores, particularly parrotfishes amongst coral reef ecologists. So there was recently a, a poll of our field conducted where they asked people that work on climate bleaching, uh, climate change and coral bleaching, um, whether parrotfishes can in fact protect corals and coral reef ecosystems from climate change. 75% of coral bleaching experts believe parrotfish protection is a somewhat or very effective in promoting coral reef recovery and resilience. 94% believe MPAs are effective in achieving these goals. So this is a really widely held belief in the field. You know, every eight months there's an editorial in science. How uh, you know the way forward is to establish MPAs, protect reefs from fishing, and that's the way we can make reefs more resilient to climate change. Um, the mechanism primarily 
is via reducing or ameliorating competition between corals and macroalgae. So kind of the, the path of events is a management action um, would protect uh, fishes from fishing, so it would reduce fishing, and that would benefit herbivorous fishes like parrotfishes, and that would reduce seaweed abundance because parrotfishes are at least believed to consume seaweed, and that would benefit baby corals because baby corals are com out-competed by seaweed, just mostly due to smothering and shading, and in theory, that would benefit adult coral populations because there could be higher rates of recruitment post disturbance. Um, and it's also believed to be negative effects of seaweeds on adult corals through, th through things like allelochemicals. So that's the purported mechanistic pathway through which local protections for herbivores would benefit corals and make them more resilient to climate change. Um, but does it work? Are there, in fact, what, the, what does the empirical evidence suggest? Do MPAs make reefs more resilient. So one approach we've taken in answering that question is to look at the literature. Lots of studies have quantified both impacts and recovery from impacts on coral reefs, mainly via long-term monitoring programs where a team goes out every year and surveys a reef, usually with video cameras or photography, and quantifies the cover and the composition of coral species on reef over time. And then uh, if a disturbance happens, you can measure the impact of the disturbance, how much coral cover is lost. So that would be your measure of resistance to disturbance. And then if you keep following the reef over time after the disturbance event, you can quantify recovery. So we typically simplify recovery, simply looking at um, the rate of increase in coral cover by going with a kind of a beginning point and an end point, recognizing that it's not uh, often not perfectly linear. Um, and I'll show you what some of that data looks like. There's a couple dozens of these studies that have been published. So this is a study from, um, from Kenya by Darling et al. So obviously it's a long time series, it goes all the way back to 1991. It's continuing now through 2022. And so they're tracking coral cover on three uh, fish reefs, the black dots, and then three, um, sorry, three unfish reefs, and then three fish reefs, the white circles here. And then this is the 90, 1990 El Nino, really warm year in the Pacific. So water temperatures were like a degree and a half, a degree and a half Celsius warmer than usual, mass coral bleaching, mass coral death. And so they quantify the resistance to that disturbance on protected and unprotected reefs and the recovery from it. So that's the kind of data that you could uh, look and ask, does local protection affect either resistance to the disturbance or the recovery from it? And um, this is one in a meta-analysis that I published a few years ago with Isabel Cotier and Lauren Toth in, uh, in a review of marine science. Um, and we found, in this case, 18 published studies from 15 countries and there was 66 MPA in which coral reef were being monitored and 89 control sites. And we only used studies where there was a quantified large-scale disturbance. It's mostly heat waves, so periods when the ocean temperatures were uh, higher than normal, usually like a degree or two Celsius for a couple of weeks. Um, and in a couple of cases, there was also indoor storms uh, and disease outbreaks, but it's mostly heat waves that this data set is looking at. And, um, well, let me just kind of back up. So this is showing the number of sites surveyed in each study. So the number of uh, protected sites and the number of control sites. So most studies have multiple protected, multiple control sites. This is the duration of the studies. So they range from, um, one was only two years and one of the longest was 30 years. And only one found any effect of protection on either resistance or recovery. And that's Mumby and Harborn. And here the effect was really trivial. It was like a 1.6% increase in coral cover in the protected area compared to like a 1% increase in the control areas. Um, so it was super small. Um, and overall, there was no effect. So this is just a, 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 the, the meta-analysis, uh, the odds ratios of all the studies comparing fished reefs and unfished reefs, the blue dots, the means from each individual study. And obviously there's no effect of protection on either resistance to disturbance or recovery from it. So the average recovery rates 
or about one or two percent per year. But uh, there's obviously a lot of variation among reefs, but no significant difference between fish and protected. So this is kind of taking a, a, a monitoring approach to it. Um, but the data set's relatively small and it doesn't cover all the regions in the ocean. So another approach, um, oh, right, so sorry. Right, so this is another approach we've taken where we don't have a monitor, well, we have thousands of monitoring studies, um, but we don't have somebody on the ground observing each individual disturbance. So what we did in, instead was to combine, combine a big coral cover database with sea satellite, sea, satellite sea surface temperature data. So it's easily, uh, it's been demonstrated that higher temperatures cause coral cover decline. And then we simply ask whether that effect was mediated by uh, protection in marine reserves or places that were unprotected, uh, they're open to fishing. And this is just the effect of uh, thermal stress anomalies, essentially heat waves on change in coral cover. And there's absolutely no difference between these. So essentially it's a dose response measuring how heat wave duration and intensity affect coral cover. So it's a function and there's no difference in the function between protected and unprotected areas. Um, so why is that? Um, it's hard to know why it's potentially um, due to the fact that MPAs are being poorly designed or poorly Im implemented. So Graham Edgar recently published this paper in Nature on what he calls the five Mioli features. So there are things like um, whether reserves are isolated or old or large or well enforced. So generally marine protected areas have to have all those features to measurably benefit harvested species like fishes and invertebrates. Um, and so in the absence of, so small reserves or reserves that aren't isolated from people um, or that aren't in forests have like no benefit, at least for fish biodiversity. So it's plausible that like we're just falling down on our reserve design or implementation. And that's kind of a hard question to get at. A lot of the reserves in our meta-analysis are in fact relatively well implemented and that's mostly assessed via the biomass of fish within them. Um, but it's, it's kind of hard to say. So another way to kind of get at that question is instead of looking at protected areas, instead going to places where there's essentially no or very little human impact. And so these are super isolated reefs. This is an atoll out in the center of the Pacific. There's a coral reef around it. Uh, very few people live there. There's a really small village. So it's not like there's no human impact, obviously, locally. There's a little bit of fishing, but it's relatively small. And there are reefs that are hundreds of kilometers from any human being. So essentially nobody goes there. And so we can look at the state of these reefs compared to the state of reefs really close to human population centers and ask simply like, do they differ in like their health, their coral cover, seaweed abundance, that kind of thing. And uh, so in this study, we actually looked at the dynamics of reefs that are close to are far away from people. And so we use a number of different indicators of isolation from people. In this one, we're using something called the scale of human influence index. This is an index that takes into account human population density, but also things like roads and nighttime lights and all kinds of other aspects of human infrastructure. So it's kind of an integrated human footprint index, but we've also just looked at raw human population abundance and there's a number of other kind of like human influence in the indices that we've used. And we essentially get the same result with all of them. And so we're simply asking here is human, is proximity to people related to the recovery of reefs after disturbances or the resistance of reefs to them? And you can see there's essentially no relationship. I mean, there's a statistically significant positive relationship here. Essentially more people means reefs are recovering faster, but I don't think there's any like mechanistic explanation for that. I think it's just kind of a spurious relationship or there's some other code factor that we're just not aware of that's, that's causing that. I don't think people are somehow, the presence of lots of people somehow benefiting corals, but we're not seeing the expected declines in recovery rate or resistance to disturbance uh, with people that we might expect. So this is an even bigger data set. So this is just state data. So we're not looking at resistance to or recovery from disturbance. It's just how much living coral cover is there along a log gradient of human population density. So these reefs have 
nobody living within 50 kilometers of them. And obviously these reefs have hundreds or thousands of people uh, living within, um, living clo in close proximity to them. So no, there are certainly isolated reefs that do have exceptionally high coral cover. So these reefs have nobody close to them and they have like 70, 75% coral cover. These are the reefs that people publish science and nature papers on. They go there, they do a survey, there's lots of coral, there's no people, it must be people that are causing coral decline, right? So they're very cherry picked surveys. Um, but there's thousands of reefs that have equally high coral cover that are adjacent to huge uh, uh, coastal population centers. Sometimes they're within 10 kilometers of a, a huge city. And there's lots of reefs with nobody living near them that have very low coral cover. And obviously, this is just a big shotgun plot. There's no association between human population density and coral cover. And I was really surprised to see this, right? Because, of course, the mythology in conservation biology, it's all people. So if you just kind of get away from people, you can lessen impacts to nature. Um, and a lot of people just don't believe this. You know, they just, that's just so stuck in their mind. And if you go to these isolated places, there's lots of corals and everything's doing fine. Um, but there's a ton of case, case studies where people have shown these really isolated reefs. There's no fishing, no people, no pollution. The water's gin clear, but as soon as the temperature warms up to a degree Celsius or so, there's massive coral die-offs. There's just dozens of case studies published in the literature showing that. This one is um, from uh, the Chagos Archipelago. This is one of, if not the world's most isolated and pristine tropical reef ecosystems. So it's in the central um, Indian Ocean. So the Chagos are right down here, well below uh, the Indian subcontinent, so way out uh, to the east um, of Africa. And only one of the islands is inhabited now. So you might have heard of Diego Garcia. There's a small military presence there. Nobody lives on any of these islands. There are hundreds of kilometers from the military base, so there's no fishing at all. Um, you can see how clear the water is. This is what these reefs look like before a mass bleaching event in, I think it was 2016. So clear water, lots of healthy, fast-growing corals. Um, and this is a time series of coral cover at different depths, so going from five to 25 meters in depth um, on these reefs. So back in the 80s, it varied between 50 and almost 80% coral cover. And then um, in 1998, that big El Nino, there was a big coral die off here. There is recovery over time. But then again, in 2015, there was another mass die off. So coral cover dropped to about 8% on average across these reefs. And this is just the ENSO index. So it's showing the cycling in the Pacific Ocean between El Nino. El Nino and La Nina events. So the El Ninos are really warm. There's that big warm 98 event. And then there was another big warm year in 2016 that caused this mass bleaching. So all these corals turned white and they were all dead within about six weeks across hundreds of square kilometers of reefs in the Chagos. Um, and this is what it looks like now, just like coral rock. So no people, but it looks worse than anything than the Florida Keys where there's, you know, 10, 15 million people living within like 50 kilometers or so. Of course, you all probably have heard about the Great Barrier Reef, another great example of this. So in the past, so this is, all, this is Northeastern Australia and the Great Barrier Reef runs about um, a thousand kilometers down the coast of Australia. So in 98 and 2005, so past mass bleaching events caused by ocean heat waves in Australia were down here in the south. So down offshore of Townsville and Cairns, so close to people. And nothing happens up here in the north. Almost nobody lives up here. These reefs are a lot more diverse because you're closer to the equator. These reefs are really dangerous to survey because there's man-eating crocodiles that swim out and just like chomp down on people when they're surveying reefs out there. So it's a really sketchy place to work. No people within hundreds of kilometers. Again, some of the world's like most pristine and intact ecosystems. And so the argument was the bleaching, well, the bleaching and the mortality happened down here in the south because up here in the north, fishing is not allowed. Ocean, the food web is intact. You know, there's great whites and tiger sharks and man-eating crocodiles, and it's more diverse. So all these factors were thought to protect these reefs from bleaching. 
But we learned that we were completely wrong about that. So in 2016, these reefs warmed. So this is just an ind index of something called degree heating weeks. So it's the number of weeks that temperatures were a degree Celsius uh, warmer than the historical average at each location. So we had reefs that were warmer than average for um, over two or three months. And the heat wave in this case was way up here in the north, where in the south, there was no change. This is showing where we lost coral cover. So this is coral cover change. So the light green is no change over time. The dark green is actually increases in coral cover. So these, these reefs did well here in the south, whereas the reefs way up in the north lost a lot of cover. Some of them lost as much as 60% of their relative cover. And so in a sense, this is not surprising, right? So where the disturbance happened, there was a response by populations and communities. Um, but it was an important lesson because it really woke up, I think, most of the scientific community that the reason these reefs hadn't bleached earlier was not due to diversity or management or isolation. It was just luck. It was just pure luck. A heat wave hadn't happened. And as soon as it did, there was massive impacts. Now, there was, interestingly, another heat wave that happened the following year. So the Great Barrier Reef got hit by extreme heat waves in 2016 and 2017. And the impact in 2017 was noticeably less. So this is a paper uh, Terry Hughes and colleagues published in Nature Climate Change. So what they're showing here is essentially the dose response. So the relationship between the number of degree heating weeks, how long the, the, the heat wave lasted, and the probability of severe bleaching. So there's that function there in 2016, and then it's substantially lower in 2017. So at a, a given uh, impact size, um, there was a much reduced response, a lower impact. And that's not really surprising if you've been working in the Caribbean. So remarkably, I haven't seen a mass bleaching event in the Caribbean since I was an undergraduate. It basically, there was one in 2005, a smallest one in 2010, but the really big mass bleaching events in the Caribbean happened in the 80s and the 90s. We do not see them anymore. I haven't seen one in 15 years. And that's not because climate change has stopped. Caribbean reefs are measurably, substantially warmer than they were when I was a student. But the, the community has really adapted. So there's less coral, but there's much less susceptible coral. So we are essentially selecting for resistant uh, species and probably resistant individuals, which is just naturally making reefs more resistant uh, to disturbance. Um, so in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, this is actually, um, this is what it looks like when the GBR bleaches. This is one of the surveys, this is Morgan Hatchett, surveying uh, corals on the GBR during the 2016 event. And so you can see all these corals have turned um, white and they have mostly all died. And all of these white corals that are, they are really colorful corals, these are essentially the competitive dominance. They're the really fast growing plating of cropperids. Um, their, their strategy is essentially to grow really quickly. Um, they outcompete all their neighbors by growing over the top of them and they shade them out. Um, but they're very sensitive to all kinds of disturbance, to temperature, certainly, but also to predator outbreak, disease outbreaks, physical disturbances from storms. So whenever a disturbance happens, these uh, species all disappear. So the more of these species that are present when the disturbance comes through, the more coral is lost. Um, so essentially, you have the healthiest reefs being well, healthy the way we describe it, as in lots of coral and lots of these really pretty plating corals that we equate with health, you know, uh, qualitatively, these reefs are far more sensitive to disturbance than reefs that have been hit really frequently, which really isn't surprising when you think about just kind of disturbance ecology generally. Um, so in 2016, um, Stuart uh, Smith et al. found actually the same thing just during one event, um, just over space, not over time. So they found that reefs with low cover had uh, substantially less relative change in coral um, compared to reefs with higher cover. So this is just a similar metric as degree heating days and of degree heating weeks, which is the duration of the heat wave. And so the highest cover reefs are where coral cover declined the most. 
Um, and going back to that, uh, st that study from Africa that I showed you initially, you can really see the same thing happening here. So this was the unfished reef, which did start with much higher coral cover, but it was those really sensitive plating corals that were dominating these reefs because of the form of fishing is literally walking out onto the reef flat with nets and then scooping up fish. So where you're not allowed to walk out on the reef, you get lots of coral. And where you are, you have relatively less coral, but the impact was much greater on the protected reefs than it was on the unprotected reefs. They both ended up in the same place and they both recovered at about the same rate. So again, I think what is happening is that we are naturally, well, the chain, it's not natural, right? So the, the, the disturbance regime that we have amplified both in frequency and intensity via greenhouse gas emissions has been doing the job of making reefs more resilient to those very disturbances. Um, so on the one hand, I guess that's good news because reefs are becoming a lot more resilient. But on the other hand, we're, we've lost a lot of like what we value, at least you know, qualitatively about reefs. Hot, we love these high coral cover reefs with really beautiful, colorful corals, and what we have remaining is really different. And I think there's also implications for ecosystem services that both people get from reefs and uh, that the associated species uh, get from them as well. So I'm not saying it's necessarily like a good thing. It's not like reefs aren't impacted, but they're very different now than they were 30 or 40 years ago. So warming doesn't just cause bleaching and disease. Another major impact of warming on reef ecosystems and of course tropical communities is increasing hurricane uh, frequency and intensity fueled by the greater heat content of tropical seas. That, that's where uh, cyclonic storms get their energy, just uh, hurt storms moving over them. So the warmer the water, the greater the storm intensity. That's why we're seeing these rapid increases in hurricane categories when they move over warm spots as they approach land. Uh, like Ian went from like a one or a two to like a, a four, you know, within less than 24 hours because it moved over a, a, a warm patch of the sea. So this is the historical track of every storm we've recorded uh, going over the southwestern Atlantic. And so we put together a database of all the cyclonic storm tracks and then all the coral reef locations, and then essentially quantify interaction. So essentially every reef, every strike of a storm on a reef location in this whole greater Caribbean area, including um, south, southeastern Florida. And we found that there is a, a noticeable increase both in intensity, and that's measured by uh, max wind speed over time, and in, in frequency, so the number of storms, at least impacting coral reefs has increased over time. Um, and so like the question is like, what impact is that having and how are reefs kind of responding to that change? So it's just like kind of another layer, another aspect of this kind of amped up disturbance regime that reefs and like countless other natural systems are experiencing now. Um, so interestingly, similar to bleaching, we found that um, back in the day, reefs would have, sorry, hurricanes would have a massive impact on reefs. So there are studies from the 80s where like hurricanes would go over Jamaica and just like just decimate everything. There'd be a massive change in coral cover. And you know, you'd get a paper in science. Nowadays, there's hardly ever any effect. And you, you might have seen Pete Evans's papers on this on St. John, right? So Pete documented massive impacts in the 80s, Hugo. And another storm, and then he just experienced a storm there a couple of years ago. Um, you might have been a co-author on that paper. I don't know if you were. No effect at all of the storm. And we found that's a general trend. So this is the, the change in coral cover of hurricane strikes over time, where obviously there's not, this is not indicating an increase in hurricane numbers, but there's more people out there quantifying their effects. And they're obviously like noticeable, well, they're, they're indistinguishable from zero. So there's no general effect of storms on hurricanes anymore. Um, and a, I think, I mean, it's hard to know for sure, but our explanation for this is a change in composition. It's actually driven by the altered disturbance regime. Because we've moved into an increased disturbance regime, what we have now is essentially the weedy survivors, the species that are naturally resistant to disturbance, 
and they're they're essentially unaffected by it. I mean, they're probably affected physiologically. Maybe the reproductive output goes down a little bit for a period of time, but there's there's very little lethal uh, effects. And so this is the differential response of a crop or a server cornice, which used to be the dominant kind of framework building coral on reefs across the Caribbean. Um, it's now like almost unmeasurable, unmeasurably uncommon. Again, it's not things, but like you almost never even see it. And so this is over all the storm impacts in our whole database where we've combined those storm impacts with coral cover surveys at each location. Um, this is what happens when storms hit. So you've got kind of a stability or a slight decline maybe in a crop or a cover potentially caused by other factors. There's a decline from the storm. I'm not sure that this is real or not, but there, at least in the data, there's this lag and then there's like a further decline. But whether or not this portion is real or just like an, uh, an artifact, um, the, the coral cover keeps declining up to 10 years post disturbance impact. And some people have done some neat studies showing why that is. There's a variety of reasons that disturbances like storms appear to uh, cause a big proliferation of coral bores, things like snails and polychaetes that eat corals. Nancy Nolan does a lot of work on that. They seem to proliferate um, disease outbreaks for even years after the disturbance, maybe because they stir up microbes in the, in the, the sediment. We're not really sure what the mechanism is. Whereas the relative cover of these weedy species just keeps going up and it's, you know, there's no effect of the storm impact on the cover of weedy species like Freddy's asteroides right here. This is like a small little boulder coral, maybe a super dense skeleton, like, you know, you could like, like whack on it with a hammer, like you wouldn't even dent it. Whereas this coral, like if you just kind of like pushed on it, it would all like topple. So really physically sensitive coral, really dense, robust coral. Um, so again, in the one hand, that's, I guess positive in a conservation sense because the, the system is naturally selecting for these more resistant species. But two things: one, just the architecturally, this species is not providing the same kind of habitat, right? Just like this little lump on the ground, where this is like this big branching coral. So it's kind of like cutting, clear cutting a forest. You're going to have stuff coming up, like really resilient weeds, but they're not playing the same role. The second thing is these small corals are very, very slow growing, whereas these grow 10 to 20 centimeters per year. So even though the reefs are becoming more resistant to disturbance, their recovery is also going down. So in a, in a sense, it's kind of locking this increased desert disturbance regime, is locking the reefs into this kind of degraded state dominated by these weedy species. Again, because there's less of an impact, so they're more resistant to disturbance, but the recovery rate is much lower because these species are growing a lot slower. And that's what we think of as kind of this self-reinforcing cycle of weediness that people are seeing in lots of systems where disturbance regimes are amping up. Um, so in this case, we've got greenhouse gas emissions, increasing ocean heat content, that's both in causing greater storm frequency and magnitude and uh, more bleaching and disease. There is selective coral mortality largely at the species level. So this is multi-species level selection, but there's probably also selection within populations and species for more resistant individuals, although that's not really well documented. And then you have altered species and trait composition. So you end up with a greater resistance to disturbance, reduced recovery, and that's locking these reefs into low cover, low functioning states that again, aren't apparently affected by disturbance, um, but there seems like there's no quick recovery from them. And and to layer on top of that, the disturbance regime is just accelerating so fast. So Hughes et al. did a, um, a big meta-analysis of bleaching frequency, and the return time between bleaching events just a quarter century ago was like 18 years. So every 18 years, there would be a, a return of a mass bleaching event. Now it's like six years. So every six years, a reef is experiencing a disturbance event. So there's very little time for reefs to kind of recover and kind of return to that original state and composition. So the take home is obviously that I don't think that we can manage resilience locally by excluding fishing. I mean, I think we should exclude fishing. I'm very supportive of uh, marine protected areas. I just don't think it's an effective tool to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and ocean warming, just like you know, our national park system is wonderful, but you know, national parks are being impacted by climate change. There's, there's 
lot of fires and fires in Yellowstone. Um, they can't keep temperature out, and a lot of that uh, impacts associated with temperature. And people often ask me, then, what should we do? I think what we should do is mitigate greenhouse gas emission. And of course, you're all probably familiar with the tools we have to do that, renewable energy, changing our diets, the food system, the big driver of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane. Um, and if you haven't been to drawdown.org, how many of y'all heard about drawdown.org? I'm not gonna do it. So this is an organization, they've been around about 10 years now, and they assess the relative impact of like hundreds of potential solutions to climate change and, and removing greenhouse gas emissions um, from the atmosphere. So this is a list of some of their, their um, most impactful uh, solutions. Food waste is actually a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, health and education, plant-rich diets, refrigerant management, all kinds of things like that. And so under different scenarios, they, they model literally how much reduced emissions would, would be achieved by different policies. And right now on their website, they have over a hundred different policies and you can rank them in different ways. Um, so, you know, we are beginning to be able to kind of quantify and rank these solutions. And then the interesting thing is we've got like over a hundred potential solutions. So I don't think there's a shortage of solutions. Many of them are relatively small, you know, they're not going to solve the whole problem, but, you know, even like banning fossil fuels wouldn't solve the whole problem because 30% of the problem is our food system. We've got to address kind of all these things simultaneously. So I'm kind of an absolutist. So where I come down and how do we protect trees from climate change? I don't think it has anything to do with corals, doesn't have anything to do with scuba diving or fishing. It's really like you know, putting solar panels on roofs and these kinds of like, like local, national, and international scale policies. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming. If anybody's out there in the ether, thank you all. And thanks for inviting me. Oh, pardon me if this sounds ignorant, but um, do you see with the, or do you mean by what the community means, water comes from Do you see like migration of coral reefs? No, that, areas? We, so that's not ignorant at all. So that's a great question. We do. So there's a couple of quantum, like documented cases of reefs absolutely moving northward. Um, so they're moving from like the Florida Keys into kind of the West Palm Beach, kind of Fort Lauderdale area. And of course, that's like common in like almost everything right. in the oceans. It's, it's relatively slow in corals because they first class will disperse a little baby that floats in the plankton and then lands somewhere and then takes 10 or 20 years to grow up. The two limitations with corals though are one, just like there's gotta be suitable habitat. So like in the Caribbean, there's really not much because there's no, they need hard substrate and there's not a lot of hard substrate off of like anywhere north of kind of central Florida. It's very kind of like muddy and salt because of all like the riverine input, you know, like if you go diving off like Cape Fear, the Cape Fear River just dumps so much sediment out there. It's not, it's got to be shallow too because corals are photosynthetic. So you need like five meter shallow, clean, bare substrate for them to land on. And that just doesn't exist. In the case of the Caribbean, the, the most of the species we're talking about, we never see recruitment anymore. Like almost, like almost never. You see the recruitment of really weedy species that are becoming dominant. The main things I'm talking about, they just don't recruit. And we don't know if it's because of a change in environmental conditions is too warm, or just because like the brood stock is so suppressed, there just aren't any more babies. Or maybe there's like alley effects and they're so spread out, they're just not reproducing successfully. In other places, I think in the Pacific, I think it's a better chance that that's gonna happen. Um, and their people are already like modeling where they will go and thinking about this is the place we need to protect that we're going to predict anywhere where they're going to be in like 25 or That's a great question. Yeah. I'm curious, like you mentioned that the sort of structural change in reefs like this protect the world are going to last for something like you're saying. Uh, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what effects that has on the rest of the community that's living around the world. Like, is that documented? I meant that there's diversity loss happened. It's so shockingly poorly done. It's really amazing. Yeah, I can't really point to a single study that's looked at like changes in a invertebrate richness. Um, there's been a couple that have looked at like changes in fish fish richness, 
And I'll say most of those are in the Pacific because those big plating of crawford corals, a lot of Pacific fishes are obligate. Uh, they obligately like recruit as babies onto those corals. So they're kind of swimming around as larvae in the water column and either they hear or smell those corals giving off a special scent and they swim down and they kind of hang out on those corals. And if those corals are gone, either they come down and they just die, they get eaten, or they just don't smell their special smell and they keep on going. Surprisingly, there's a lot of Caribbean reefs where the coral covers like five or 10% that the fish community honestly does not seem to care. Like in part though, because a lot of the coral skeletons are still there. So the, those branching corals, when they die, they quickly kind of like crumble, but all those big ones, they're still there. I mean, they were, they've been dead something like 20, 30 years, and there's not been a, a big change in structure. Ultimately, they'll bio-erode from like sea urchins scraping on the skeletons and like sand scour from storms, so they, they won't be there forever. But I guess they're gonna be there for decades or centuries. Um, so I was diving in Little Cayman Island in July with my family, and like coral covers like 10 or 15%. Like there's pretty good coral, but it's like nowhere near historical. But there's little to no fishing, and there's just tons of fishes. So it's I mean it's not you know not pristine, but there's a lot of fishes. So I think there's still a lot of remaining structure. Oh, and other species that are replacing corals are providing structure. So it's not hard structure. So things like sponges are becoming really dominant now. Soft corals or gorgonians, they're, they're flexible, so it doesn't provide like that seawall that people depend on, but it seems to be providing like, some of the structure, at least in the Caribbean. I think, again, I think things are really different. Well, like you've been into Morea, and those reefs are very flat, right? Even when there's a high coral cover, it's just like a, a flat area with lots of coral. So when the coral dies, it's just like painful, right? But a lot of, you've been to St. John too, and it, it's a lot more like lumpiness, right? Even though the coral's mostly dead. Boulder coral, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's intense fishing at both places. You probably have no idea like what effect it's having. But, but I know it's amazing that nobody, there's no science paper like that's a decline. It's kind of like the insect decline. Like, like who knows? I mean, maybe the things that are replacing corals are facilitating small invertebrates. You know, like if you take a clump of algae and it's shake it into a bucket, there's 20 species of polychaetes and nematodes and crabs. So it's kind of hard to say what's happening, at least on a small scale, about biodiversity wise. We also don't know like what impact the warming has on those animals either. Like there's almost no, it's all coral, right? I mean, there was a paper published associated with the GBR bleaching that showed fish were also really impacted. Like we used to think of fish impacts as happening subsequent to the coral loss, but they looked at it in real time and fishes all dropped out too within like weeks or months, probably because it exceeded their thermal tolerances. Like it got to 32 C and they just aren't experienced with that. And they, you know, they, they, they died. There was a big shift in fish species composition, but almost nobody pays attention to those other ones. It's harder, right? It's harder to like count polyheat. I mean, people can't even identify them. Like, of course, why they might even describe them. Yes. Um, is the what? The sun, the, the sun coral? The tuba strata? Yeah. The little red one? Yeah. No, no. I mean, I'm not even sure I believe they're invasive. People say they're invasive. Okay. I mean, I'm not like questioning you, like everybody said that, but they, those coral, the tuba strata, it's like a little coral. It's not even, it's not hermitific, so it has noses and belly. They're small, they live in dark places, kind of like underneath here. And they're like in every place I've ever been, like in the world diving, there's like tuba strata, some, some species that too. So I'm skeptical that they just weren't in the Caribbean. Um, but yeah, no. Really? Yeah. Goes to Brazil. Interesting. They die when they breathe. And then that tuba strata comes in. Yeah. I never heard that. Did not know that. Yeah. Now they seem pretty uncommon. In the Galapagos part, there's a lot of them. They're really beautiful. But there's not many. The, the corals there are mostly gone. So maybe that's one reason there's a lot of tubes right now. I thought about that. Good point. Well, I know this isn't specifically your focus, but I'm curious about your thoughts on this. What's different about the Caribbean? 
sort of a window into the future, or is it a window into the future? So most of Pacific people would say it's it's poorly managed. There's too many people. We've been fishing it for. I mean, the native peoples of the Caribbean have been fishing for like over a thousand years, and there's even evidence of overfishing from like archaeological middens going back a thousand years. Like Jeremy Jackson would say it's because it's been intensely overfished because of all the people on all the islands. Um, and all the pollution, you can say from all the sugar cane plantations, all the runoff of that kicked in, we, we would blame it on that. I think it's just bad luck. I think it, it warmed 30 years earlier than the Pacific. And the Pacific now, it's indistinguishable in terms of coral cover and the GBR and a lot of the Caribbean because now it's warmer there. You know, there was like Pandolfi and they published a, a, you know, a half a dozen science papers about how the Pacific was healthier because it was more diverse, right? There's like 10 times the pearls that used to fit in the Caribbean. I think it's luck. I think it's where the heat waves happen. And when you talk to the modelers, why did the Caribbean warm, warm earlier? They actually argue that even though greenhouse gases distribute, they don't distribute perfectly. So the models actually predict more earlier warming in the equatorial Atlantic than in the Western and Central Pacific. Um, because that's where the greenhouse gas emissions were coming from, right? And they were first coming from England, and then they were coming from North America. And so at least the models and the historical records seem to suggest that like that's where warming happened first. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Thank you all.